Okay, our next speaker is also a remote speaker, and it's Aninja de Merki, Mer, Merkurji. Oh, wait, darn, I messed it up. I was practicing and practicing, and I got it wrong. <laughs> Aninda Mukherjee, uh, the founder yeah. and CEO of uh, Global Business. He's a global business executive with 20 years enterprise leadership success for high growth organizations. He has steered six technology startup spinoffs and M&As and helps bring in venture capital investments to several startups. He has managed businesses across Europe and North America. And India is a 30 year veteran of the plastics industry and has helped commercialize polymers, including polyamide 4, 6, and pH, PHA, and food additives and nutris, nutraceuticals. After having spent over 15 years in the field of bio based materials, Aninja co founded the nonprofit global organization for PHA to promote the use and proliferation of PHA. In 2019, he founded FaxTech Inc. Uh, that is developing a novel technology to commercially produce PHA biopolymers from waste gases. He has a, a bachelor's in chemical, engin chemical engineering, I bet is the right word. Engineering, a master's in polymer science and an MBA from Vanderbilt University. And we're gonna give you um, keep an eye on your screen because we're going to give you a like a heads up a couple minutes ahead of time just so we can stay on time. Okay. Great. Thank you very much for that introduction and thank you very much for having me today. Um, so what we are trying to do is uh, to commercialize the material called polyhydroxyalkanoids, and we are trying to do that in a very specific area: uh, barrier paper coatings in food service, beverage, and food packaging. So before I get into our technology, I wanted to give a little up, uh, update or a background on PHA or polyhydroxyalkanoids. These are a family of naturally occurring biopolyesters. Um, about 150 of these monomers have been already discovered and uh, four of them are commercially available at the moment. They've been around for about 20 years, I'm sorry, 120 years. And um, since the 1970s, they have been sporadically commercialized. Uh, however, they have been very expensive and difficult to, uh, to, to, um, to make. So they are still very expensive. However, with the, with the latest wave of industrial development that is ongoing, and especially with, uh, the, uh, you know, with, the, with the plastics pollution issues and the, uh, the global climate change problems, uh, these materials are poised to become the material of choice in the next decade. They are recyclable, compostable, marine, freshwater, and soil biodegradable. So this is a very unique combination of properties, and they act like plastic. So they biodegrade in soil, freshwater, salt water. Uh, they are biocompatible, uh, bioabsorbable. In fact, certain oligomers of these PHA molecules already run in our blood. And since they are microbially, microbially produced, they can be also recycled, composted, incinerated, all of that good stuff. And of course, they're renewably produced. So here's a chart on the right side where you can see that their biodegradability is very close to cellulose. And um, so PHA basically are completely circular. They are you know, natural, 100% biodegradable. You can recycle them, you can incinerate them. They are energy compounds, so they can be also used as an energy source. Uh, that means incinerating to generate uh, electricity, for example. Um, they, are, they are home and industrially compostable, and if leaked, they would biodegrade just like cellulose. So we know today what the problem is. We, are all, we all know these cups, beverage cups that we use. And we use them without ever thinking if what would happen at the end of their lives. Most people think that these are very sustainable material, uh, the coffee cups. But these paper coffee cups are all coated with a plastic coating inside, generally polyethylene, which means that at the end of their use, they would either be incinerated in Europe, for example, or landfilled in the US because. 90 plus percent of the value of this cup is in the cellulose fiber that would be wasted. So we would generate either carbon dioxide or methane. So our solution is that if you take the same cup and you coat it with PHA, you can recycle the paper, 
up to seven times, or if the if the cup or the food service packaging is not actually um, recyclable for contamination or whatever reason, they can be composted to generate organic fertilizer and biogas. And this biogas is, the use of the biogas is what constitutes our technology. Uh, Factech was awarded a, a competitive grant from the National Science Foundation in 2022. Uh, we continue to do the work on this, in fact, not so far away from Madison uh, in Wisconsin. So we have uh, the, the, the core team consists of um, uh, Keith, Nick, and myself. Each one of us have 30 years plus experience in our areas. Uh, Nick in the paper, paper and polymer coatings area, Keith in polymer dispersions with 15 issued patents, and myself um, in the plastics industry and in PHA. And we are collaborating with uh, Clemson University and with San Diego State University as academic partners, uh, but we are also looking for other partnerships with other universities as we speak. Um, our goal is to really solve the paper packaging's grand challenge in sustainability. What they really are looking for are, again, what, what was discussed earlier this, today, that is leveraging existing infrastructure, which means that we, the paper industry doesn't want to put in very expensive, new paper coating machinery. So they want to be able to use their existing paper coating machines. They want the product to be cost competitive. That doesn't mean that it has to be the same price as polyethylene, for example, today, but still, if it were five times more expensive as it is today for PHA, that would be difficult to introduce as a new product. And last but not least, scalability for PHA. So while we are developing this technology uh, based on biogas usage, we don't intend to develop every little piece of it ourselves. We are trying to partner or we are partnering with uh, commercial reactor technology people so that we can scale our technology very quickly from strain development to pilot scale to commercial scale. Our goal is try to be as competitive as possible to polyethylene. So within 20 to 50% of the price of polyethylene, for example, Currently, competitive PHA is very expensive. Like I said, it's between three and five times more expensive than what um, polyethylene is. There are other polymer coatings being uh, developed as well, but most of them are also very expensive. Uh, whether they're acrylate based and they're they're only they're recyclable, but they are not really compostable. There is some uh, microcrystalline cellulose and nanocellulose based um, technology being developed, but they are all very expensive. While, you know, PHAs, if you look at PHA in general, overall, it can replace about 50% of the world's plastic usage today. So it's a huge potential. But, you know, and that translates to something like 200 million tons of plastic replacement. So about 350 to $400 billion. But what we are trying to do is we're trying to leverage PHA's um, very good uh, barrier properties because it's a polyester. Uh, it has barrier properties very similar to um, PET. So we want to leverage that barrier property and uh, go after a small sliver of the overall market, which is about th the, the total available market is around $13 billion for all kinds of uh, polymer coatings on paper. Um, and our specific market is about 3 million tons. Uh, so that's about $6 billion. So what we're trying to do at the moment is we're trying we're seeking an investment of somewhere in the range of three to five million dollars, and with that, what we plan to do is to generate some revenue with available with by using available PHA molecules that are you know that are still expensive, but at least for a market adoption and traction purposes, we think this is necessary. And during those uh, during that time, we would demonstrate our own uh, PHA polymer coatings at a pilot scale, so at a few tons a year. Um, that ought to take us to a um, an inflection point with multiple exit opportunities. Not that we wish to exit, but definitely from an investment perspective or an investor perspective, uh, that creates an opportunity where that can be leveraged uh, through either 
partnership, licensing, or sale, for example. So uh, at the bottom, you'll see that there is a little um, um, you know, pathway as to, you know, we started in 2019, but of course in 2020 and 21, we, we did little because of COVID, and, uh, but nonetheless, we, we accomplished quite a bit. Uh, we received our grant financing last year, and we are getting ready now for um, to go and um, get some equity investment uh, so that we can continue our work. So with that, I would like to end. And if there are any questions, uh, I'm very happy to answer them. Thank you for your time. So people on Zoom can hear also. No, I'll give you a minute while I grab my thing for the next person. Oh, here we go. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so my question is, uh, the PHAs could be a different length. What's your favorite length and how is it made? Uh, yes, of course, uh, like all polymers, you know, they, they, if you want to use a polymer, they have certain molecular weights, molecular weight distributions. Um, generally speaking, 200, 50 to 450 is the range depending on the usage. Uh, of course, you can go to very high molecular weights as well. Uh, they're all microbially produced, uh, these materials. So which means you have essentially a fermentation process uh, where the microorganism actually manufactures or makes the product um, inside itself. And then you have a cell disruption and then eventually uh, you know, uh, extraction and, and, and separation. Yeah, with the with the length, I was meaning the monomer. Ah, okay. Uh, yes, uh, the, the 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 monomers are so. For example, the most um, abundant PHA is poly three hydroxybutyrate, which is the P three HB. Um, there are also P three HB, um, for example, valerate as a co monomer. Um, the 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 homopolymers are difficult to use this is um but you know if you have valerates uh, as a uh, you know depending on the percentage can be quite um quite a bit lower in melting point so they are they can be processed easily then there is the hexanoids there is also the 4 hydroxybutyrate um so i work with all of them uh since 2006 and uh we um of course we are targeting a very specific molecule um, that we can certainly share with you at a certain point in time under confidentiality, but not not openly. So we have a couple minutes if there's another question. So I forgot to mention that my colleague, uh, Dr. Dustin Heaney, is present um, in person. And uh, if there is, uh, if there are any questions, comments, or anything that you would like to know, uh, I think that this would be uh, perfectly all right uh, for you to reach out to him, um, and and you know, and then we can get back to you with questions and comments and things like that. Yeah, thank you for your talk. Um, just a general question for someone who doesn't know a lot about this: How can something be both biodegradable as well as a good? resistive coating? Well, um, biodegradability is a natural phenomenon. So for example, if you look at uh, paper, um, you know, if you look at papyrus from the Egyptian days, you know, they, they are still in very readable form because they were preserved. They did not biodegrade, but cellulose is very biodegradable. So biodegradation occurs when there is microbial action which means that if you leave something in the soil, if you leave a PHA, you know, for example, this pen here, is manufactured by a Swiss company, it's made with, um, with PHA. If you leave this pen buried in the, in the soil for about 90 days, it'll disappear. But you can ride with it for decades and nothing will happen to it because it does not see any microbial action. Well, thank you. I think we're going to move on to the next presenter. I appreciate your 
presentation. Thank you. Okay, we have one. We have one more remote speaker, uh, Michael Lafollette. Um, he has served as Director of Strategic Business Development at GIVO since December 2021. He holds a BS in Chemical Engineering and an MBA from the University of Utah. Michael has over 15 years experience in engineering, maintenance, and operations management in a diverse range of industries, including mineral processing, power generation, and petrochemicals. Before joining GIVO, he served as Senior Manager of Operations Excellence at Texas Petrochemicals Group a private equity owned chemicals company where he developed and led strategic business improvement initiatives and ensured alignment between operations and commercial outlook. Michael is a results driven leader with emphasis in manufacturing leadership, work, pro work process optimization and financial modeling. And Michael, we'll give you a heads up when you've got a couple minutes left. Okay, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here um, remotely at least. So uh, we'll get to it. I've got a lot of slides here, so I'll move quickly. Um, and then hopefully there'll be a couple minutes left over for some uh, some questions if there if there are any. So let's see. I think I've got the screen up. Yep. Okay. So just a quick overview of Givo. Uh, we have about a hundred employees. We are based in uh, Denver, or actually Inglewood, Colorado, just south of Denver. Uh, and we've got some operating facilities up in uh, Northwest Iowa. We've got a dairy RNG facility with about 20,000 head of cow. Uh, we have a mark uh, development, <clears throat> excuse me, development facility in Laverne, Minnesota, where we do uh, testing of our isobutanol um, production. Uh, we have some contracted uh, conversion facilities in Texas and Silsby, Texas. And then we're also uh, currently in groundbreaking of our net zero one plant in Lake Preston. We'll talk some more about that here in just a moment. Uh, sustainable aviation fuel, there's a lot of talk about that, a lot of interest, a lot of excitement. Um, what we look at is different ways to decarbonize the aviation industry. Um, it's most challenging for the medium to long haul flights. Uh, so it represents a bit of a challenge to use electrification or hydrogen fuel cells or other technologies for those. And, and we feel strongly that sustainable aviation fuel really is the technology that will, uh, for the next several decades, uh, be able to decarbonize and, and defossilize those, those uh, sources of, of fuel, uh, greenhouse gases. So what is sustainable aviation fuel? It's basically the same molecule as um, jet fuel that comes from a fossil-based oil. Uh, the difference is it's actually coming from CO2 in the air, coming down and, and getting sequestered or captured in uh, plant, plants and other vegetation or captured through um, uh, the fisher tropes process. Need to use a bit of renewable energy to convert that, and then you get your jet fuel out of that. So one of the requirements to actually be able to be used on a plane in the wing is uh, ASTM standard D7566, which requires a maximum of 50% blend of that sustainable aviation fuel in uh, Jet A or uh, regular fossil jet. So that's the, the standard right now. There is quite a bit of work right now to evaluate that, um, that standard and see if it can be increased in the future. But right now, that's one of the requirements. So with GIVO, uh, we see the demand uh, increasing dramatically. We currently have about $10 billion in financeable offtake agreements, uh, totaling a little bit north of 350 million gallon per year. So those offtake agreements are coming from uh, energy traders, um, airlines, and other partners. Uh, worldwide, if you look at the global demand of aviation fuel, it's around 130 billion gallons. Uh, if you decarbonize, uh, there's a global initiative to um, uh, put sustainable aviation fuel in or, or uh, uh, replace 10% of that. And so it'd be about 13 billion gallons worldwide by 2030. So it's a very large market, very large demand that's out there. Feedstock is always a topic of interest coming uh, when talking about sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, with GIVO, we use carbohydrates, particularly corn. So those carbohydrates uh, then get converted to ethanol and then ethanol into uh, sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, there are other feedstocks available, uh, particularly there's the cellulosic. Uh, there are 
bio-based fats and oils. But most importantly of all, uh, we need to ensure that the entire supply chain for those feedstocks is incentivized to produce, uh, produce those feedstocks sustainably. So carbohydrates to SAF, uh, really we're looking at producing a net zero business system. And what that means is, you know, we talked about the feedstocks, use of defossilized energy during that catalytic transformation. And then you get your drop in sustainable aviation fuels and other renewable fuels as part of that process. The important thing to do with that is making sure that all of that carbon reduction savings is properly tracked. So we have a program in place called Verity Tracking. We'll talk about that here in a moment. But it's a blockchain enabled tracking system to account for all of that carbon savings and carbon reduction. Make sure that those that are participating in that supply chain are properly uh, properly incentivized and, and um, paid for that effort. Now, when we're talking about circular systems um, and net zero circular economies, you got to have your circle chart. So this is Jivo's circle chart of uh, renewable energy, renewable sources of um, to get to that fuel. Now, the interesting thing about sustainable aviation fuel is if you use fossilized energy um, in our life cycle analysis, the actual life cycle score is higher. Uh, so if you start with ethanol, most ethanol plants have a CI score uh, measured by California GREET of about 70 to 75. To convert that ethanol to jet fuel takes another 24 points or so, giving, getting you up around 95. So in order for you to get a, a life cycle that is lower than fossil, you've got to use a number of methods and that's what we, we employ. We've got defossilized electricity, uh, defossilized thermal energy along with uh, engineering designs, renewable hydrogen, you know, green hydrogen, uh, use of carbon sequestration, and then smart agriculture practices. And that can get you down very easily to a net zero life cycle on that sustainable aviation fuel. So up in Lake Preston, which is our, our first facility, first commercial facility, uh, we just broke ground this fall. It's going to be reducing around 700,000 metric tons of CO2 per year, equivalent of around 4.6 billion uh, passenger miles in a commercial aviation flight. So we're very excited about that and, and look forward to that, uh, that project. In Net Zero One, we've partnered with Axons. Zero uh, Six, who was formerly known as Jewel, uh, Fluid Quip and Praj to develop this Net Zero design. It will produce around 400 to four, 420 million pounds of high protein feed, uh, 30 million gallon uh, 30 million pounds of corn oil and around 65 million uh, gallons of sustainable sustainable fuels um, including naphtha and diesel that does that plant is going to be using a combination of wind energy hyd green hydrogen uh, biogas from our dairy rng site in iowa and the ci score will be um, very low, and I think I've got a slide on that here in just a moment. So Net Zero One is going to be the largest economic project in South Dakota history, uh, north of $800 million of capital, uh, expected to employ around 1,000 uh, 1, people during construction, ultimately leading to around 90 full-time employees of the facility. The wind farm that's going to be built and uh, in support of this will be around 90 megawatts and employ another 15 people. So the overall uh, net jobs will be around 105. Now that site has only 60 million gallons. We, get, we need a lot more than that uh, to satisfy our project. So, so we are in the, in the process of developing more capacity. We need to develop it faster looking at a combination of new sites uh, called greenfields, also looking at utilizing existing ethanol capacity that's already in place and seeing if we can partner with those folks. Uh, one of the other aspects of 
life cycle analysis, making sure that we properly account for all of the carbon reduction that's part of that process. So we've partnered with the USDA and received a $30 million grant to help develop that growers program and that variety tracking system. Uh, we've also got some other major partners as part of that, namely Google and Southwest Iowa Renewable Energy. And we're excited to keep moving forward with that project here. So some of the smart agriculture practices that, that we are advocating for, including tilling and uh, you know, low-till, no-till, use of cover crops, uh, various fertilizers, um, and then some other precision farming can get you quite a bit of reduction and capture that reduction in your life cycle, uh, life cycle analysis score and get that carbon stay, uh, stored into the soil. So again, going back to the Verity program, this is a system that is uh, auditable, it's traceable. Uh, we've partnered with Block Size Capital uh, to help develop this technology. Uh, the, the carbon credits are uh, will be tokenized and they can be traded, um, sold, but that but in any, in any case, the value of the carbon reduction will be able to go back to the supply chain. And whether it was a farmer, a trader, a blender, they'll be able to realize the value of those carbon credits as part of that supply chain effort. Um, and then, so what that leads us to is, you know, offset carbon markets versus inset markets. Um, the use of the Verity tool really focuses on establishing inset credits to that supply chain, and Verity is a key part of that. Uh, offsets are, there is a place for offsets, but they are harder to track. Uh, they aren't usually given as much value, uh, and that's why we want to try and get this Verity system uh, up and running and, and really tap into that secondary market. Uh, in the slides, we've got a number of other videos that you can uh, take a look at online on our website and see more about our, our plan. Um, but I'd like to thank everyone for letting me be here. We appreciate it. And if there are any questions, happy to take them. We have a couple minutes if anyone has a question. I'm Michael, Steve Zonka here from CAFE, and, and I don't mean to put light a fire under your chair, but I, I talked this morning about Jivo being one of the entities working in this space that has talked about their own billion gallon capacity. Do you have any top line observations about uh, how you're able to scale to uh, try to deliver on that concept in the, in the time frame that we're talking about? Yeah, thank you. So yes, I, I did fail to mention, thanks for bringing that. We have our, our billion gallon plan to get to uh, 1 billion gallons of sustainable fuel by 2030. Uh, we currently have you know up to around 400 million gallons of offtake. Uh, and then, like I said, the, the net zero one site really is going to produce around 60 to 65 million gallons. So we've got a long ways to go to close that gap. We've got a number of projects that are in the pipeline, uh, a number of partners that we're working with, and we're actively really uh, working on scaling up bigger than net zero one and looking for deploying of the additional assets in different locations for that. What we're excited about is the feedstock uh, is not really a limitation. There's quite a bit of corn that's out there oh, and, and ethanol providers and producers already in place and looking at partnering with those and um, developing that pipeline of sustainable fuel to the market. So we think we can get there. Uh, it, it's ambitious, but we uh, we have a high degree of confidence that we'll get to that billion gallons by 2030. Thanks, Michael. Um, we're at time, so I think we're going to move on now, but appreciate your uh, presentation. Thank you. So that's the last of our remote presenters. We're back to being in person now. And next up, we have Nan Nagura. Uh, he's Dan Nagura. He's a professor in UW-Madison's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. 
His research group works on environmental um, biotechnology with a focus on bioengineering and sustainability. His research interests include the biological transformation of lignin and other lignocellulosic materials to valuable chemicals and minimizing the energy use and biological processes during wastewater treatment. So I'll turn it over to him now. You hear me? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I thought I'll tell you a little bit about the research, basic research that we're doing with the concept of, there's a lot of organic materials that are residues and might end up in the, bio, uh, in the landfill or not utilized as much as we could in a circular economy. So I'm gonna give you different examples of that. Um, so let's just start with uh, lignocellulosic biomass and the idea that we can make uh, fuels from um, the, the plant material, the, the cell wall, and you have a distribution of different polymers in there. You have the cellulose, where is where you get the sugars to make the ethanol or the biofuel. You have hemicellulosis, when a lot of research goes on into trying to figure out how to break that down and also make it into, into your biofuel. Then you have the lignin, and that's typically a residue. It's typically used for uh, generating energy, burning it, and maybe distill your uh, ethanol that way. We think that we probably could make something better or something more valuable than taking 100% of that lignus, uh, lignin and burning it. So what can we do with it? It's the most abundant uh, polymer of aromatic compounds in nature, yet we don't use it for aromatic materials or for chemicals that are now made from aromatics that are in petroleum. It, it's really formed by synthesis from three typical um, monomers labeled here in blue, red, and green, um, slightly different chemical structure, and it all goes outside on the cell wall and gets all um, bound together, not by enzymes, uh, radical chemistry. So you end up having a polymer that is very amorphous in structure. So the question is, how do you gain value from that? So this is our, our plan. The, the idea is to use um, different technologies to break down that lignin. Maybe you depolymerize the biomass, you get the lignin, or you already get some aromatics, but they're not gonna be a single aromatic. There's gonna be a soup of different aromatic compounds. Then we use biology. We use a microorganism and we call the, the function biological funneling. The idea is that if this organism can consume 20, 30 different aromatics with just a slightly different structures, we could generate a single product. So even if this, there are some of those materials that are valuable on their own, trying to separate it from multiple things is gonna be uh, a nightmare. Vanillic acid, for example, is one of those compounds that can be produced there but uh, the, the, the extraction is gonna be more difficult. So can we funnel it into a product? And I have here a product that we have focused on, uh, PDC. I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, it's a um, dicarboxylic acid. And we are focusing on this about this size of materials because when you break down the ring or you manipulate that aromatic ring, that's what you, you end up with. So there is uh, an idea that this PDC material is a very good adhesive, could be used to replace some monomers in the manufacturing of other plastics and, and polymers. So there is there's research going on on that. We're not particularly doing that research. Other, other groups are doing that research. But we can also think about making muconic acid or adipic acid, which are precursors in the making of, for example, nylon. So if you can get some of these organic residues to replace some of the production of these uh, precursors that are from, from fossil fuels, we start to contribute to the circular economy. So just briefly to, to make PDC, that original uh, material, it happens to be this compound here. So it's in the pathways of the transformation of the different aromatic compounds. And I told you that lignin is made out of three different aromatics. They will enter here here and here in the pathway. So we have a way of funneling everything towards a single material if we can 
make the microorganism accumulate that material. So um, we, we, we then stop the pathways that degrade the, the PTC and channel the materials also in the pathways towards that, eliminate that other one. And it gives, a, gives us organisms that are very efficient at converting the aromatics into that um, PTC. You have a question or? No? Okay. So that's how we do it. Uh, there is different pathways to try to get to adipic acid and mucanic acid that I'm not going to show you. Is it economically feasible? I think that's a question everybody wants to know. And uh, so we, we, we cannot do this alone. My, my work is in, in the microbiology of, of the whole thing, but I cannot take plant material and get it all the way to making a product. Uh, you need to depend on other different aspects of, of industrial activity. So we combine here the different types of uh, technologies that the Great Lakes Bioenergy Research Center has worked on. And um, so try to figure out whether this is feasible with these technologies. So your first technology here is when you get the biomass uh, pretreatment. So we use in this model gamma lactone, which is a method of physically separating the, the different materials in the biomass and getting to the sugars without the need to use enzymes. So that's one of the benefits of using this GVL material. And you can do that and in that way separate the lignin. The lignin comes out as a solid that is separated now from the sugars that are will go to make um, your ethanol in this case, also in that graph of peripheral production. Um, and this is not moving. There. Now you get to the lignin depolymerization. So we use a technique that we have used in the GLBRC that is um, reductive depolymerization, um, hydrogenolysis. So you, you have an, uh, uh, an anaerobic environment, you use hydrogen uh, and you use uh, catalysis. And that breaks down the lignin into the individual uh, monomers. We have monomers, not everything can get up to monomers. So there's mon oligomers and monomers we need to uh, figure out how to separate them. I said initially you need to use some of the lignin for energy. Uh, so the idea is that you will take the monomers for this biological funneling. You will take the uh, oligomers to generate the energy and the heat that you would need in the process. Then we go to the microbial uh, activity and we have bioreactors generating this PDC, this biological funneling, and eventually getting to the point of recovering the product. So, so, so it's a pipeline that needs to be done. And, and we did our first exercise of this. Is it, is it feasible? Is, it, or is industry going to like the product, the, the value? And this is what we ended up with. And uh, so $12 per kilogram, everybody's going to tell me that's too expensive. That's orders of money to too much than, than what we would be interested in. So that's the reality of where we are at it now. Maybe we can, we can lower it some by, by uh, improving different steps, but we really need to seriously improve different processes. I said, I'm in the microbiology side of this and we have done some work to, to get the improvement going. Um, we started with, with some of the initial models started with like three millimolar production of PDC. We got into different types of bioreactor operations to get it to 26, to get it to 40, to get it to 80. We wanna get above 100 uh, if, if we can. Uh, but now in the, in the research side, we're getting to a point of um, decision-making here because I truncated this graph, the reality of the graph, and this is stopping again. Where do I point this? Or where's the computer? There, thank you. So um, we get to a point in which things uh, go sour and our PDC production goes down, our uh, aromatics continue to increase and so on. So, so we're working on that. It's, the, it's inhibition of the micro by different uh, materials that we have in there. So current research is going towards improving reactor uh, feasibilities on this. So that's what I have on uh, that particular material, lignin as a, as a residue. We're also looking at other residues 
Um, and one of the things to think about is from the lignocellulosic uh, conversion to materials that produce you ethanol, the residue from that, about 50% of the energy gets converted to ethanol. About 50% of that energy is not necessarily that, that uh, used for, for biofuel. Uh, so that's the lignocellulosic conversion residue. Some of you might know chemical oxygen demand as a, as a measurement of the reducing value of the material. So we compare materials. So lignocellular residues, there are also residues from uh, ethanol production from starch. That's the one in the middle. Uh, there is also residues from, from the dairy uh, industry. This is, for example, a residue that uh, comes out of filtering milk. So in, in terms of those units, 50, 70, 97, they're about the same. They are very large units. Uh, and so we can generate value from that if we can figure out how to do it. So typically these materials are not completely wasted. Typically they go to an anaerobic digester. You generate biogas, you recover some of the energy in the form of, of biogas. And, and that's a microbiome. There's a, a complex microbial community that's doing this. Uh, this is the path. For, for that uh, activity from the complex organic materials, there's fermentation, goes to simpler organic materials and organic acids. Um, then everything gets funneled into acetate and hydrogen, which are the only substrates that methanogens consume. So if you need to generate methane, you need to produce uh, acetate and, and hydrogen. What if you cut this in half? That's the, that's the goal. So if we avoid producing methane, and we can maximize the production of these intermediates and somehow recover these organic materials, organic acids, they might have more value than going all the way to the biogas. So that's the idea with that in, in, in general terms, as longer the molecule of the organic acid that you produce is, the less soluble it is, the more energetic content it has, the more value uh, currently it has. So out of looking at these linear organic acids, we're interested on, on the larger ones, the hexanoic, the octanoic acids. So the question is, can we take these organic materials, these residues, and make them produce this? Um, so in the lignocellulosic uh, biorefinery model, um, this is what you end up having. Uh, the material goes to uh, the, the construction, uh, the five biofuel formation, distillation of the ethanol and you end up with this residue. That's what I'm talking about. Um, so it goes to energy, anaerobic digestion and heat, and I'm running out of time, I see you coming. Uh, but if, <laughs> if you put in between that, that fermentation and then you recover those valuable products, um, and then the rest goes to anaerobic digestion, maybe you're recovering energy. Two minutes. So uh, just a, a chart of what we are able to do with a biological reactor on this uh, residue. We, the bottom graph is the hexanoics and, and octanoic acid with, with uh, butyric acid there too. So we can continuously have production of these materials from this, from this residue. We did a model, techno-economic model, it reduces by 18% the minimum selling price of ethanol if you were to put this on a larger scale biorefinery, cellulosic biorefinery. And uh, in 30 seconds, I'll show you a diagram that that's not the only organic uh, substrate uh, residue that we can use. We're thinking about uh, getting manure directly and doing some treatments and try to get it to these organic acids. And in more general ways, uh, that manure typically goes to an anaerobic digester. And what we have done so far is the manure itself. What, what if you could take the fibers remaining after anaerobic digestion that contain cellulose, break them apart, produce this organic acid? So that's active research that we're doing. I'll stop here. Thank you very much. I know it's hard for the presenters to only get it in the 15 minutes or 40 minutes or however much time we give you to speak. You've got so much to talk about. So I do appreciate your willingness to stay on time so we can get everyone in. Um, every time I come up here, I'm determined to be uh, smoother than the time before and I fail. <laughs> so, Our next speaker is Daniel McClelland. 
uh, the Vice President of Catalysis at Pyron, Danical and joined Pyron Inc. in 2019 as the VP of Catalysis, where he leads the laboratory R&D development for the bio-based 1.5 pentanidial pentanidial Okay, pathway and new C5 derivatives. In addition to his R&D responsibilities, Dan plays a key role in the scale up of the 1.5 pentadiol process, working to bring it to commercialization. He holds a BS in chemical engineering from Illinois Tech and a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where he received in 20, which he received in 2018 and was focused on catalytic, catalytic conversion of biomass. Dan, take it away. Is this the mic working? Oh, yep. there we go. Okay. So uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, so uh, I work at uh, Pyran. So uh, at Pyran, we are look, our main process is for converting uh, furfural into a compound called 1,5-pentane dial. Um, so we have a uh, patented process for uh, this conversion, and we uh, reach uh, over an 85% uh, overall yield in the process. And uh, right now, we're actually currently working with uh, investors and partners for scaling up from the lab scale uh, to a commercial plant. <clears throat> so um, here's 1,5-pentane uh, dial. Um, so currently, uh, dials are used in a variety of uh, polymers, so we, they're in paints, adhesives, uh, elastomers, uh, as well as coatings. Um, and yes, it's our first product and we are also branching out into some other uh, C5 compounds, but um, our, our primary focus is the commercialization of 1,5-pentane uh, dial. Um, so uh, why are we doing 1,5-pentane dial? So especially uh, dials are critical building blocks for a lot of our polymers. Uh, currently they come from uh, petroleum sources. Um, so the specialty dials I'm specifically mentioning is 1,6 hexane dial, which is a C6 analog, and uh, also the, our 1,5-pentane uh, dial. Um, so right now these are currently used, um, in, as I mentioned before, in various polymers, um, polycarbonates, uh, polyesters, uh, polyurethanes, acrylates, which go into uh, a variety of, of uh, everyday, uh, my, uh, everyday uh, materials. <clears throat> um, so right now, um, the petroleum-based 1,5-pentane dial uh, production is actually, uh, actually from a side product of the 1,6-hexane dial production. So uh, we're uh, first also looking at, you know, uh, producing 1,5 penton dial uh, on purpose, so it's not tied to uh, production of another material, but also in general, um, looking at um, applications where we can replace 1,6 hexane dial. <clears throat> uh, so for our uh, process, uh, it starts with a uh, renewable feedstock such as uh, corn cobs, wood, gas, uh, essentially non, uh, non food sources of biomass. Um, and um, this is done actually uh, already uh, around the world is uh, furfural production from, from these agricultural wastes and other, other sources. <clears throat> um, and then we take our, our furfural and make uh, the 1,5 pentane dial. Um, so uh, our process, um, we've, uh, we've been uh, researching for a uh, number of years now. Uh, we found it to be a kind of cost advantage over the, the incumbent uh, petroleum-based products. So the 1,5 pentane dial from petroleum is uh, sold at a much higher price. Um, we also have a high yield with uh, low-cost catalysts um, and uh, without a liquid recycle. Um, it's all a th thermal catalytic conversion. Um, and um, as I mentioned earlier, we do have uh, this uh, process patented. Um, it's spun out of the University of Wisconsin here, so it's through WARF. <clears throat> Um, so uh, one of the big advantages of our process, being a renewable process, is um, the uh, large greenhouse, greenhouse gas uh, emissions compared to petroleum-based uh, 1,6 and 1,5 pentane dial, uh, 1,6 hexane dial and 1,5 pentane dial. So uh, we've estimated about a greater than a 95% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions with our process versus um, the petroleum-based process, which goes through, uh, I think, Ka oil produces a dipic acid through to 1,6 uh, hexane dial. Okay, um, here's a little more in, in the chemistry for our, our uh, process. So we have a uh, kind of four-step process where we start with our furfural, we hydrogenate it into uh, tetrahydrofurfural alcohol, uh, 
we do a dehydration to dihydropyran, another uh, hydration to uh, two, uh, two hydroxy tetrahydropyran, and then our final hydrogenation to one five pentane diol. Um, you know, some people may ask, well, why don't you go straight ring opening of THFA? That requires um, very costly um, bimetallic catalysts, uh, noble metal catalysts that um, are much more expensive than um, breaking it down into two steps. Um, we also, since these are such high yield steps, we're able to uh, get higher yields than um, the direct ring opening as well. Um, on here, we have a variety of other chemicals that we are uh, starting to branch out into uh, doing research for with, um, you know, expanding our uh, proprietary pathway, um, either starting from uh, different intermediates or uh, with 1,5-pentane dial, looking at other materials that we could uh, branch out into, um, into making, aside from the uh, polymers. So um, our process, um, spun out of a, a veto project here at uh, UW Masson in uh, Professor Huber's lab. Um, and uh, during, uh, well, it was a project uh, in Huber's lab, we did a, they did a rigorous uh, analysis in both the uh, chemistry and the economics, doing a detailed uh, te techno, techno economic analysis for uh, validating the process and uh, for us to move forward with the uh, commercialization. <clears throat> Um, so uh, here I have uh, one five pentane dial and how it can be used in a variety of these uh, different polymers I talked about polycarbonate polyols, polyesters, polyurethanes, and uh, the acrylate market. <clears throat> so um, you know, looking at the acrylates, we have uh, a variety of UV cure um, coatings um, using with that and uses. Some of the things are, I guess, fingernail polish, uh, dentistry, three D printing. Um, well, with the polycarbonate polyols, polyester polyols, more so in the coatings and adhesives uh, for a variety of other, um, other areas. <clears throat> and finally, uh, polyurethanes for coatings and elastomers um, used such as footwear and other things like that. Um, so, um, you know, one of the things that um, we have been looking at with our 1,5 pentane dial is the possibility of uh, bringing uh, enhanced performance uh, to various polymers. <clears throat> um, so we've uh, did some research looking at um, how it can affect some of these other, uh, you know, heat resistant, hydraulic resistant, um, oil resistance, and uh, weathering with one of our uh, uh, potential uh, customers uh, of the 1,5 pentane dial. And uh, they showed it was very promising with um, improved uh, performance in some of these variety of areas. <clears throat> um, additionally, um, you know, we had uh, one of our, uh, you know, potential customers who's a, a major dial producer evaluate it for uh, working with polycarbonate polyol. And um, they said that it's uh, worked very well. <clears throat> uh, it's potential direct substitute for petroleum-based 1,5-PDO. Um, and they're confident in the potential uh, of our 1,5-PDO as a monomer. Uh, additionally, we had um, some other companies uh, looking at it for polyester polyols and acrylates, uh, working with our initial test samples uh, and giving um, good review as potential uh, replacement to 1,6 uh, hexane dial, um, as well as uh, proving out that it works with uh, in the UV cure industry as well. Um, so, uh, you know, we have our initial 1,5 uh, pentane dial here going into a variety of different uh, markets. So initial market we're looking at is the uh, polycarbonate polyols. Well, uh, expanding, uh, hopefully expanding quickly into the polyesters and the acrylate markets um, at, for these kind of future end products. <clears throat> so uh, recently we've done a scale up. So previously we had all done our work in uh, lab scale reactors, both here at UW and then furthermore in our uh, labs in Madison. Um, from there, uh, over this last year, we did a thousand X scale up of the process with a contract manufacturer down in uh, the Houston area, where we were able to prove out uh, our process on uh, larger scale equipment and um, produce a uh, ton scale of, of uh, one five pentane dial. So, uh, you know, our experience there gave us a, a variety of things. So a, uh, one is able to, you know, after we produce it, we're able to supply orders to some potential customers. You know, they typically start at the kilogram scale, but some are ordering uh, multiple 
uh, kilograms up to the ton scale they're able to uh, purchase from us. Um, yeah, we have several tons already, uh, some customers are interested in several tons of this material, um, and it has allowed us to de-risk, um, you know, on our way to uh, commercialization. <clears throat> um, and it has val validated our scalability of the, the reaction steps as well as the uh, economic potential of our process. Um, and that was it. Do we have any questions? No idea. Yes, you mentioned you're, you're using a co-manufacturer in Texas uh, on right now. Do you have any, how long are you going to use that as a business model before you have your own plant um, and can scale up? Um, and where is the likely place for that future plant once you, you, you grow as a business? So, uh, yeah, we used a contract manufacturer down in uh, Texas for this. Um, that is kind of... Uh, we did contract manufacturing as opposed to doing a full pilot plant for ourselves. It saves on the capital investment because they already have the equipment and they have to reconfigure. They just have to reconfigure it for our uh, equipment. So um, our current uh, plan is to we have this we had this first scale up. Um, we're looking at potentially doing a second uh, toll manufacturing is what it's called, but contract manufacturing for a larger scale, um, maybe on the thousands of tons, and then uh, before going to a commercial plant. Uh, size of about 20,000 tons per year. Um, and how, how large is it? Um, uh, so I, I don't remember off the top of my head, but you know, we have, uh, for our testing here, we're using about six inch reactors. So it's, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know the exact size off the top of my head. Yeah, I very much like your technology. I love the idea you're thinking of multiple multiple products, uh, as, as we talked before. I'm a little bit curious about for-for-all uh, availability, however. Um, everyone talks about for-for-all. It can be made from corn cobs, but pretty much all the capacity has been shut down in the United States for for-for-all production. Almost all the for-for-all just comes from China in a hit-or-miss sort of way. So I'm wondering if you've got any plans for what does for-for-all sourcing looks, look like for this? So um, we've looked at sources kind of around the globe. So as you mentioned, China is a large profile producer. Um, there's also producers in uh, South Africa, as well as the Dominican Republic. Um, they, they, those latter two more use the gas uh, as their source. Um, so we are you know, potentially sourcing, um, we're gonna be you know, testing a variety of feedstocks and working with uh, different, talking and talk to different suppliers for that. Um, you know, eventually we would would desire a, a U.S. source, um, and we're looking at more for like uh, from wood for for that for frail. We have time for one. We have time for one more question. If anyone has any. Okay. All right, going going gone. Yeah. Thank you. speaker there. Okay, next up we have Meg Witte, who's the Vice President of Marketing and Corporate Relations at Lanzajet, uh, where she's worked since 2022. She started working in biofuels nearly 15 years ago, working for the USDA <clears throat> Rural um, Development in Washington, D.C., helping farmers and rural small businesses who were working to grow biofuel feedstocks and access funding for clean energy. From there, she went uh, to United Airlines, where she helped launch a Midwest Aviation Sustainable Biofuels Initiative to tackle the complexities across the value chain of building a new industry for SAF. Meg has experience in strategy, innovation, marketing, and operations across government, corporations, startups, and high-growth companies. Meg earned her MBA from Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management and her BA in government from Georgetown University. Am I on? Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you very much, Deb. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to say thank you to Mary and the Wisconsin Energy Institute for hosting this today. Uh, I think these are great conversations to have and uh, very excited to be a part of it on behalf of Lanzajet. <clears throat> so 
as as uh, Deb mentioned, uh, I am thrilled to be here today, but uh, have started in this this space about 15 years ago, working at USDA Rural Development in Washington, D.C., uh, working on things like Farm to Fleet and Farm to Fly, helping farmers and rural small businesses get access to clean energy funding. From there, went to United Airlines to work on a Midwest Aviation Sustainable Biofuels Initiative that helped tackle some of the complexities in the value chain across sustainable aviation fuels. So very excited to be back in this space now, working with Lanza Jet. And I wanted to take the opportunity to show you a quick video that I think does a nice job of summing up our work in the marketplace. Somebody could hit play on this one. I don't think I can do it from here. If it doesn't work, it's okay. <laughs> the anticipation is building, I can tell. That's okay. Why don't we go ahead? I can move on to the next slide. <clears throat> That's right. I'll cover most of it anyway. Okay, so uh, one thing that I will say and when I started, wanted to start off with is this statement. This is a statement that was written by our employees and to preserve the world and the opportunity for future generations to fully experience it and thrive. I think this is important because at Lanza Jet, we really don't wanna be just starting a company, building a company, building an industry. We are really working to preserve the world for our future generations. And that's uh, one of the reasons I'm very excited about this space. Steve talked about this earlier, but there is a big hill to climb in terms of the production of sustainable aviation fuel, uh, both in the United States and then globally. Today, about uh, 5 million gallons of uh, sustainable aviation fuel is produced. This is as of 2020, or 2019, sorry, prior to um, COVID. So <clears throat> the, what we need to do to grow that is a factor of 600 in order to meet the uh, 2030 ambitious goal of 30 billion gallons a year. So it's, it, it is a tall order. So for commercial aviation, and Steve talked about some of these numbers earlier, but today in the US, jet fuel consumption pre-COVID is around 20 billion gallons a year for the world, around 96 billion gallons a year. Sustainable aviation fuel, around, 90, or around 5 million uh, and 33 million gallons a year uh, internationally. So, but the exciting thing and one of the reasons that I think this time is, is so important is we really have an opportunity because of these new goals that are being created domestically, because of these new incentives like the Inflation Reduction Act uh, in the United States and also global mandates um, across the world that are being, being created, we're really beginning to see catalyzation of this marketplace and scaling of the technology. So Lanza Jet is really proud of our accomplishments in this space, but also our commitments. Uh, while we are a company that's only been around for around two and a half years, as was mentioned earlier, our technology has been in development for over 12 years, working with Pacific Northwest National Labs, DOE, um, and Lanza Tech, our sister company, who we were spun out of uh, in 2020. Uh, in 2018, our Lanza Jet technology was approved as an uh, ASTM pathway. You've heard this term uh, already referenced, American Society of Testing Materials. Uh, we already have committed 300 million gallons of jet fuel or of uh, sustainable aviation fuel uh, production to date. So preempting Steve's question about how we're gonna get to uh, our goal of 1 billion gallons by uh, 2030. I'm gonna talk about that in detail here in a little bit. But one of the things that I'm most excited about, that we are most excited about at Lanza Jet, is this uh, project we have going on in Soperton, Georgia, which I'll talk about here in a minute, but that's due to come online later this year. So pretty exciting for us. We are 
very excited and honored to be part of an organization with world-class investors and funders. You see up here Shell, Suncor, British Airways, uh, DOE, Al Nippon Airways, Microsoft, Breakthrough Energy, which I'll talk more about here in a second. Um, but these are massive organizations who are really making significant investments in time, money, resources, knowledge sharing, um, offtake agreements. So I know that question came up earlier. We, we have those with major airlines. Um, and that's all important to think how you, to think about how we're building a new industry and scaling it. So we were really honored to, uh, Steve mentioned this earlier, but last year get a $50 million grant from Bill Gates's Breakthrough Energy. That does a lot for us. Um, one, it reduces the green premium and reduces the over cost, overall cost of capital for Lanzajet in how we're creating the fuel. It helps enable this ur urgent action in the marketplace and helps us continue to move forward with this plant specifically down in Georgia. Um, and it just generally goes to catalyzing more gl global growth to see these types of investments. So we're, we're really excited about it. So our technology, I'm going to talk about here in a second, but one of the things I did want to talk about, I know ethanol has been talked about a lot. I'm from Iowa, uh, big ethanol state. Obviously, I think Wisconsin is around seventh. I think I checked recently in terms of ethanol projection. So I'm, I'm uh, partial to it, but I also want to talk about the fact that Lanzajet believes that as we look at overall ethanol produ production, Today with first generation ethanol, there is a 3 billion gallon a year market in the Americas, North and South America that exists today with first generation ethanol. And as we continue to scale up and leverage first generation ethanol, while we do that, we are also able to think about how we're moving to waste-based ethanol sources um, and cellulosic. So there is plenty of feedstocks. As we look at our projects around the world, and these are locations where we are currently uh, building out projects, um, there is an abundant supply of feedstock, whether it is energy crops or woody waste or ag waste, municipal solid waste. Uh, this has been talked about before, but there is, there's a good amount of feedstock available for, for this. <clears throat> so the lands of jet process is a, a sort of four step process, beginning with ethanol, we dehydrate it, ethyl, to move to ethylene, uh, oligomerization process, hydrogenation, and then fractionation where we break it out into sustainable aviation fuel and renewable diesel. Uh, for our plant down in Georgia, we will have about 90% SAF to 10% renewable diesel. <clears throat> uh, so our fuel exceeds uh, current fuel standards. Uh, it's approved by ASTM, greater than a 70% reduction in GHG emissions, uh, clean burning with no sulfur, reduces overall particulates, um, and reduces contrails, which has been a, a big uh, contributor to overall GHG. So I'm really excited about this. This, uh, and I'm, I'm right here in this little tiny picture over here, but I started about, uh, I think, a month before this event happened at Lanza Jet, and this is our Soperton project down in Georgia that as of this day, we had about seven of this sort of the modular facility, seven of these units built. And I'm going to show a picture of what it looks like today here in a second. Uh, but we're really excited. This is going to come online later this year. It'll be 10 million gallons a year of renewable fuels, nine of which are sustainable aviation fuel, one of which is renewable diesel. So uh, pretty exciting for us. This is going to be online here soon. So again, here's the picture from December. And this is, uh, I think, was taken two days ago. So you have a facility that in a month and a half has already come a long way. So we're, we're pretty excited about the, the advancement so far. The other thing that is, is important to us at Lands of Jet is important to me from a rural development perspective, it's not just about creating the fuel, it's about the impact you're having in, in rural communities and economies that you're, that you're building in. So at Fur Freedom Pines, we'll have an impact in the Port of Savannah, uh, rail transportation, road transportation, $70 million in annual economic activity, which is significant. Um, I'm going to move down 125 direct construction jobs, 31 permanent jobs on site, up to 50 indirect jobs on an ongoing basis. So significant for the rural communities that the biofuel industry has. Um, and, and we believe strongly in working with the communities where, where we're building. Another one of the projects that we're excited about that I wanted to talk about is happening in South Wales. So this is Project Dragon, stands for the Decarbonizing and Reimagining Aviation for the Goal of Net Zero. This is the Welsh flag, if you're wondering. 
um, but it is in Port Talbot, South Wales. We're working with our sister company, Lands of Tech, on this project. And why this is, I think, especially cool is it's taking the off gases from a steel mill uh, and converting that the, the, those carbon emissions into ethanol with Lands of Tech's technology. And then we're taking it and turning that, that ethanol into sustainable aviation fuel. So pretty exciting. That's going to be a 30 million gallon a year plant uh, that's due to come online around 2026. So as we think about deploying our technology globally, we talked about how we're scaling up, how we're going to be meeting that goal of 1 billion gallons by 2030. It's 2023 now. By 2026, we will have um, already committed to uh, 300 million gallons of, of production that will be coming online at that point across these several projects across the world. So we're pretty excited about it. It is a tall order. This industry is hard. There are incredible complexities behind it. Um, but with the incentives, with the mandates that have happened, with the sort of catalyzing of this industry, it's a pretty exciting time, I think, to be a part of this space. So I'll leave you with this last sentiment. At Lanza Jet, we believe that someday is now. We talk a lot about someday we're going to have, we're going to be able to build out the technology for this industry. And someday we're going to work on mitigating climate change. And someday we'll have the investment that we need to, to get there. Well, it's happening. Someday is now. And I know that's, that's exciting. And I think there's a good opportunity there for us. So thank you very much. We have some time for a couple of questions. Uh, hi, thanks. Uh, really, really neat talk. And I was curious in the Georgia plant, uh, yeah. you mentioned a 90-10 split from yep. uh, jet fuel to biodiesel. Renewable diesel, yeah. Uh, renewable diesel, yeah. Uh, but I was just curious, like, is that set from the feedstock or is that, uh, or how is that set and can you manipulate it? You not? can is manipulate it. it. Yeah, we, we, it's, it's a choice that was made, but we want the 90-10 split and for it to be mostly a sustainable aviation fuel, but you can adjust it. Follow up question? Yeah, go ahead. Just I'll one try follow to up. What kind of range do you have to adjust it uh, as markets change? It's, it's pretty significant in terms of the range, but um, I'm not 100%, but it's, it's pretty significant in terms of what you can adjust to. But for, for us, this, the focus is very much on sustainable aviation fuel. We have time for another Meg, question. Meg, we have one over here. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, this is just very brief. I was curious, what is the uh, origin of the name Lance? Uh, yeah, that's a great name? question. Thanks. Yeah, it's a great question. So I had the same question when I started. Uh, Lanza is actually Spanish for spear. And so the idea is that we're spearheading uh, clean energy and innovation in this space. And Jet, hopefully it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory. Why Silverton? Great question. Um, so a couple of reasons. Uh, our sister company, Lanza Tech, actually had their uh, pilot plan, their facility down there already, so owned the space. So we worked with them on the project. Yeah. Yep. Yes, that is also true. Range fuels, yes. Yep. Yeah. Time for one more if there's another question. But also great because it's close to the port of Savannah. So in terms of shipping, it's a good opportunity. Thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate it. So we have one more speaker, and then we're going to do a little conversation again. So our final speaker is Dave Kettner. He's the president and general counsel at Virent. Dave joined Virent in 2007 and served as the, as the company's VP of Legal Affairs and Business Operations before taking on the role as president in early 2019. He is a licensed attorney with 20 plus years of experience in intellectual property, contract and other corporate legal and business matters. Uh, and before joining Virent, Dave served as chief legal counsel for the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, Worf, and an attorney in private practice working with Quarles and Bradley LLP. He currently serves on the board of directors for the Advanced Biofuels Association, Bio and Bios Industrial and Environmental Section, and the Alternative Fuels and Chemicals Coalition. Dave holds a JD in law and a BS in genetics and cell biology from the University of Minnesota. Great, thank you. Good afternoon. So I know there's a break after this, so I'll, I'll try to 
keep it short, uh, albeit I did some using my lawyer background, a little bit of negotiation with Mary. Um, so I'm gonna talk about both fuels and chemicals. So we may go a little bit longer than 15 minutes. Um, the lawyer me tells you that whatever you're gonna hear from me, don't believe it, form your own opinions. Uh, we are owned by a publicly traded company called Marathon Petroleum Corporation. Um, so you have to form your own opinions and make decisions on whether or not you wanna purchase their stock or not. But let me actually kick off by hopefully this works. In 2002, researchers at the University of Wisconsin established Virant to develop technologies for making bio-based hydrogen. Just a few years later, they discovered that a byproduct of the process looked and smelled like gasoline. They tested the byproduct in a lawnmower, and it worked, launching a new generation of technologies for producing fuels and chemicals. From those first seeds of innovation, Virant grew. Over the years, Virant's researchers, engineers, and scientists have been fine-tuning its patented technologies that turn plant carbohydrates into renewable fuels and chemicals. This bioforming process is similar to modern petroleum refining, except the feedstock is plant carbohydrates instead of crude oil. The products from bioforming can be used to produce a wide variety of everyday necessities. Virant's demonstration plant in Madison, Wisconsin has produced tens of thousands of gallons of product, which has been used to produce components for bio-based jet fuel, gasoline, plastic bottles, polyester fibers, and more. Fuels made from Virant's process are drop-in replacements for those made out of petroleum, meaning they are virtually identical to petroleum-based products and can therefore be used in existing engines and infrastructure without any modifications. But Virant's bio-based products have a much lower carbon intensity than petroleum-based products because they are made from plants that remove carbon from our atmosphere rather than from crude oil. Over several years of development, Virant's products have been used in a variety of real-world applications. For example, Virant's synthesized aromatic kerosene took sustainability to new heights when it was used in the first ever commercial passenger flight using 100% sustainable aviation fuel in one of its two engines. Virant's bioform gasoline revved engines in a Formula One competition and that same gasoline is even registered with the US EPA to fuel everyday vehicles. Virant's bio-based paraxylene reimagined consumer packaged goods when Coca-Cola used it to develop a 100% plant-based bottle. And its bio-based paraxylene can also help provide all the durability and versatility of polyester clothing, but from 100% renewable plant-based sources. Other products from the bioforming process can be used to make materials common in today's vehicles, devices, and buildings. After years of perfecting the bioforming process through tens of thousands of hours of operating time, it's now ready for the next step, commercialization. We've come a long way since our first pull on the lawnmower. Byron's innovative researchers, scientists, and engineers have brought low carbon solutions within reach. And we're excited about the possibilities as Virant continues to grow. So that's Virant. Um, we are headquartered here in Madison, Wisconsin. So for those students in the room, we're listening online. We do have a pretty good internship program. I encourage you to take a look. Uh, for those exiting college, uh, we actually are hiring right now. So feel free to take a look as well. Um, and we look at ourselves as a big part of the Madison community. Uh, obviously, you know, coming out of the University of Wisconsin, um, I was actually sitting at, at the table over here trying to think of going back to my days at Wharf. I, I actually think that uh, Virant is probably one of the first modern biofuels or chemicals companies to come out of the University of Wisconsin. And to this day, I would think, I would like to call us, you know, probably one of the good startup success stories because in 2016, we were acquired by what was then called Tesoro Refining and Marketing Company. In 2018, that organization was acquired by Marathon Petroleum Corporation. So we are today now a wholly owned subsidiary of Marathon Petro Petroleum Corporation. 
The good thing associated with that is as an early stage company, you know, I get to focus most of our company's time on it, continuing to advance our platform. And our platform is made up of five different pathways. Um, our sugars to aromatics pathway, which I'll talk about here in a second, uh, takes carbohydrates from pretty much any source and is able to produce a sustainable aviation fuel, gasoline, diesel, as well as the principal building blocks that go into plastics, fibers, and films. Coming down the pathway shortly thereafter is at, uh, our process for uh, taking ethanol uh, and making aromatics. And again, it makes the exact same products that you would find from our sugars to aromatics pathway. We have another technology, uh, which we affectionately call DHOG. And if you ask me where that came from, I cannot tell you because I have no idea. But our scientists uh, discovered a pathway for basically making renewable diesel as well as uh, synthetic paraffinic kerosene from carbohydrates again. Our fourth path pathway, which we call Savolysis, uh, is able to take lignocellulosic materials, uh, deconstruct that material, extract the sugars and some of the lignin derivatives, and be able to feed that into our process uh, to be able to make the same products that I just talked about. And then lastly, the technology that the company was founded on is our APR hydrogen technology. And that's the ability to go ahead and to take glycerin and other types of carbohydrates and to, it, uh, and to convert it directly into hydrogen. Uh, and that's a pro uh, project that we are actually starting to bring towards commercialization. Um, but what I want to talk about today, <coughs> excuse me, is our sugars to aromatics technology. This is a catalytic technology. So we utilize heterogeneous catalysts. We do not use microorganisms or uh, chemicals or anything else in our process. It's traditional refining technology that's been modified for purposes of taking sugar water and making the same products that come from, come from petroleum today. When my 19 year old son, who's now at Georgia Tech said, dad, can you explain this very quickly to me what your process does? I basically say, we actually are able to do in five minutes what mother nature takes millions of years to do. And that's to systematically remove the oxygen from carbohydrates and to get to your hydrocarbon products. It's a three-step process where we do uh, hydrogenation to stabilize sugars, uh, HGO to lower the oxygen content, and then an aromatics uh, process, uh, uh, which we call acid condens condensation, <clears throat> to make a bioformate product. That bioformate product looks very much similar to reformate that could come out of a petroleum refinery today. And then that product is typically cut by, uh, by refiners into either chemicals or into biofuels products. And that's basically what we are looking at doing. Um, on the left-hand side is a little bit more of a detailed uh, aspect of that profile. <clears throat> we are able to fractionate a portion of that product out, our C9s and our C10s, which go into our SAK cut. We're also then able to take the lower carbon portions, put that into gasoline, or to take that uh, into the chemicals industry. And then we also have a portion of diesel, uh, which can go into the diesel space. But the interesting thing uh, of our product is it's a synthesized aromatic kerosene. Uh, so as Steve was talking about earlier today, the you know, required components that go into Jet A fuel, uh, a lot of the technologies in development today are making the paraffinic components. Well, we're able to make that aromatics component. And what that aromatics component does then, it allows us to <clears throat> combine it with the SPK and, and arrive at 100% drop in sustainable aviation fuel. It's also got some other interesting properties. Uh, it's got a very high de energy density uh, to it, and it's also got a very low freeze point, which means then that you're able to take our product uh, and mix it with other paraffinic fuels uh, that bring actually some heightened properties to the fuel itself. When you look at our, our goals and our objectives is to really bring uh, the SAK product to market, uh, first and foremost, as a blending component that will go into uh, standard jet fuel, similar to SPK. Uh, we will are currently going through the ASTM, or we, we will be stepping into the ASTM balloting process, uh, ideally by the end of this month. Uh, and our expectations, if things continue to move forward as expected, we should be hopefully annex number seven or number eight or number nine uh, uh, by the end of this year. A long term, the opportunity uh, that this presents is it allows for uh, the rest of the SAF market to move beyond that 50% threshold. By blending in a component of our fuel would allow uh, the SAF, whether it's from HEFA or Lanza Jets uh, A to J, you know, or even some of the FT uh, Fisher Tropes type, 
type technologies uh, to be able to, to exceed that 50% limit because now you're in a position where you're not cutting into your overall aromatics requirement. Uh, you have a blending component that can fill into it. Ultimately though, um, <clears throat> the goal is to get to 100% drop in sustainable aviation fuel. And we've been able to show this now on three different occasions. Uh, the first of which being a United Airlines flight in 2021. Uh, this was the first uh, flight with commercial with passengers. I will say I was on that flight, so I'm glad to be here talking to you today. Uh, so it was successful, <clears throat> but uh, that was really the first step in in opening up the door for 100% drop in sustainable aviation fuel. Since then, in December of 2022, we partnered with Gulfstream, did a successful test flight in their G650 at maximum elevation and maximum speed. Maximum elevation. I didn't know this. 51,000 feet. And then this jet can go almost Mach 1, so it's Mach 0.95. I was not on that plane. <laughs> um, and then lastly, uh, actually just a couple days ago, uh, we were very proud to partner with uh, Emirates Airlines, Boeing, Rolls-Royce, and uh, Honeywell, uh, as they did a demo flight uh, in the Boeing 777. Uh, and this is a huge, huge plane. Uh, that jet engine there, if you actually look at it straight on, it's probably from floor to ceiling. That's about the uh, height of the intake on it. And that, that particular plane uh, used a lot of fuel, uh, but again, one engine was flown 100% on drop-in uh, sustainable aviation fuel. And when I say drop-in, just to emphasize what Steve talked about this morning, it meets all the, the qualifications and, and specifications associated with jet fuel. Um, the other neat thing is, as it's depicted here, is it's a cleaner burning fuel. So when you look at the aromatics that we use, you know, there is some talk in the industry about aromatics are bad, right? Because they create the particulate matter emissions and they create some of the issues around that. Well, you know, some part of that is true. The fact is that not all aromatics are equal. Uh, you have mono aromatics, you have polynuclear aromatics. Uh, well, we make primarily the mono aromatics, which means then that it's a cleaner burning fuel because that mono aromatic compound uh, actually combusts very, very well. Our studies, uh, as well as studies of others, have shown that you know, you'll see a 35 to 70% reduction uh, or lower particulate matter emissions than compared to jet fuel. And this is both at elevation as well as at um, atmospheric levels. Um, so that's jet fuel. So now I should tell you though, I forgot to mention this earlier. So when we produce our product, <clears throat> we produce in our bioformate product, about 40% of it is jet fuel. The other 60% is gonna be the lower carbons that can go into gasoline and chemicals. And so when we go to market with our gasoline product, this gasoline product uh, will have a carbon intensity of 70% or even better uh, reduction compared to uh, petroleum-based products with the potential to get to net zero or even lower depending upon inputs with respect to renewable energy, um, carbon capture sequestration and et cetera. But in addition to gasoline, that very same product can go into the chemicals market. And we've already been able to demonstrate this today on multiple different levels. We've worked with several leading brands and organizations to demonstrate that our pair xylene that can be extracted from uh, our, our low carbon portion, as well as some of the other materials such as benzene, toluene, uh, and other mixed xylenes <clears throat> can be uh, seamlessly put into the chemical space. This has been demonstrated as mentioned in the video with Coca-Cola <clears throat> when it produced its 100% uh, plant-based bottle. Um, similarly, and uh, more on the fashion side, uh, we finally made it to Paris Fashion Week. Fortunately, I didn't make it to that one either, um, but uh, Issey Miyake, a, a big fashion house out of um, uh, Japan brought two garments onto the stage that were 100% bio-based. Uh, and we were very proud to participate in that in, in the sense that the paraxylene portion that goes into that garment uh, was originated here in Madison, Wisconsin. Similarly, uh, working with Torre, our uh, partner on the fiber side, uh, ANA has introduced a green jet uh, into their fleet. The green jet includes upholstery you know, throughout their plane, which is bio-based. Uh, some of that being originated from uh, our, our facility here in Madison. And then lastly, Personally, I think the coolest thing is Patagonia. So in December of this year, Patagonia released uh, its sugar down hoodie jacket. Uh, only 5,000 were made. I understand there's only a couple left. So if you're interested, I would get out there sooner rather than later. 
But this jacket is 100% uh, bio-based, made from 100% bio-based fabric. Uh, the polyester portion of which, you know, is polyester that was produced using our material. Or, uh, it was produced using materials derived from, from our facility here in Madison. Um, if you look at, you know, how do you make polyester today, you know, roughly 65 to 70% originates from Paris Island, and that's, that's what our, our process produces. Um, so when you start looking at, you know, really what is Virant's capabilities and what we are looking to commercialize, uh, it's a true biorefinery. So as Tim mentioned earlier today, you know, some benefits associated with the true biorefinery, you can have diversity on the front end, diversity on the back end. Uh, chemicals can come in to help carry the costs associated with the fuels components. Well, that's what our process does. Because we do use heterogeneous catalysts, we're able to use sugars from pretty much any source. Uh, we've done testing and we've wor worked with beet sugars, cane sugars, corn sugars. We've also worked with sugars from lignal cellulosic um, provided by third parties, as well as some uh, aspects of what we've been developing as well. Our commercialization strategy is to really build a refinery based on here in the US, the most uh, accessible uh, sugar today is cornstarch and sugars from cornstarch. <laughs> but long-term then, as technologies become available with uh, lignocellulosic sugars, we'll be able to take those sugars into that exact same plant. So we don't have to set up a customized plant you know, that's uh, created specific for those sugars. We can process a mixture of C5, C6 sugars, uh, you know, polysaccharides as well. Those can all go into our process. You just need to make it uh, uh, liquefiable, you know, by mixing it with water. Same thing on the back end. <clears throat> um, you know, we'll be producing a jet fuel product. Uh, you know, we'll also be producing gasoline. And, you know, my opinion is um, you actually have to use and build a gasoline market you know, so that you can uh, uh, increase the amount of supply of material that you can go into the chemicals industry uh, so that you can maintain some of the bio-integrity requ you know, required by the industry today. So our model is basically building a refinery, providing the SAF into the market, uh, and then seeding the market with respect to chemicals uh, and bringing low carbon gasoline in as well. So, oh, I forgot I had this slide in here. So, so what's the main focus? Our feedstock is sugars. And so as I think we've talked about earlier today, when you look at the availability of feedstocks for the long-term, carbohydrates is certainly the leader in the sense that you've got the options for uh, sugars that can come from first-generation sources or long-term from lignal cellulosic materials. And certainly this opens the door when you start looking at opportunities to work with the egg industry, to look at sustainable uh, farming practices, and to find ways to lower the overall carbon footprint across the industry. So what is our commercialization strategy? So right now uh, we are through the demo scale. We've been operating our demonstration plant here in Madison, Wisconsin for a number of years now uh, to the point where we feel that we are very comfortable to go to a full scale operation. Uh, currently our demo plant has produced well over 30,000 gallons of viral formate. Uh, this slide is a little old. Uh, we've produced, I think about 5,000 gallons of SAK has been used in demonstrations. Uh, and well over 25 tons of Bioform PX has been used in demonstrations across the chemicals industry. And so now our focus then is let's get that first plan out the door. Uh, so again, to head off some questions, I will not share with you today what the timeline is, where that plant's gonna be, what's the size of it, uh, who's partners in it, uh, cause that's all continued to be in development uh, as we are moving forward. Uh, however, I am excited to tell you that, you know, as we continue to progress, um, SAK is going to be a big part of that. Not only have we done three demonstrations, but you also see more demonstrations coming down the pipeline uh, with other different aircraft. Again, kind of getting to the point of what Steve was alluding to is the long run, what we want to be able to do is provide a 100% dro uh, drop in sustainable aviation fuel um, that would allow us to move sustainable aviation fuels across the entire globe into every part of the world. Uh, without having to change the infrastructure or the air, aircraft that's being flown today. And I think Virant is positioned very well to make that happen. So with that, I will open it up for questions. Got one over there, and then you'll be next. Okay. Yeah, I noticed uh, you referred uh, earlier in the presentation to Johnson Matthey. 
Um, are they the company that uh, took over Staley out of Decatur, Illinois? I don't believe so. Um, Johnson Matthey is a catalyst company out of London, out of the UK. Um, you know, most actually most people probably or used to drive a vehicle that had catalysts that would come from the company, but they're a big catalyst provider in the refining state space, uh -huh. also catalytic converters. So, you know, that's what they make. Uh, they also have a technology arm. They will be our catalyst uh, provider uh, for the plant. Right. No, because I remember vaguely from back in the uh, 80s, the company Staley was somehow involved with Johnson Matthey. I don't remember the details, but they gained a lot of notoriety nationally because there was a protracted a labor dispute down at Staley in Decatur. Yeah, I, I think it's probably a different company. Uh -huh. OK, so, thanks. Yeah. And just in case you're curious, Virant is green in Latin. Virant is green in Latin. I had one here. I was just uh, curious, at, uh, probably naive question, but I, I see the word used, the balloting, when you're talking about that ASTM uh, validation. And, and balloting just struck me as a weird, I, could you help me understand that? Is there some vote there or is it just regulatory? Or I was curious why that was chosen when I saw it in your talk and then again at Dave's. I'll, I'll defer to the expert because. So yes, it actually is a voting process. So the concept is that the entire body of research data around the fuel, the properties, and some potential testing on different components of the engine are brought to the entire aviation industry. And that industry represented in, in a group that reports to ASTM, ASTM D02J, they actually vote, all right? And if there are negatives, uh, more work may have to be done or the entire group adjudicates the negative and says, yeah, we understand your concern, but that's not a real concern. But anyway, it requires 100% agreement to pass, to create the annex in the spec that allows him to go out and sell this as jet fuel. I've got two questions. Sure. This goes to you and Meg. What driver, what event milestone will lead to plant number two in both of your cases? And then the second question is, what, does, what has to happen in the upper Midwest in order for these facilities to be deployed in this region? So uh, I'll start and then pass it off to you, Matt. Um, so for us, uh, what has to happen, well, I probably what I should back up and say is uh, we are not looking to deploy this only by ourselves. So our model is to be owner operator in some of these facilities working with our parent company, Marathon. But we are with Johnson Matthey, we actually have initiated a global effort to license the technology uh, across the world. And so when we talk about the second plant, I mean, for me, the second plant is, well, let's get some more people to, to sign a license. But still, ultimately, at the end, of, end of the day, no one's going to put capital into a second plant unless that first plant can be proven to be successful. You know, or at least, <coughs> excuse me, you've gone through certain steps in that milestone. We're talking about new technologies, you know, which are being brought to market. And so the more and more that you can de-risk that technology, whether it's through a demonstration in Georgia, uh, or for us, it'll, you know, it's our demonstration unit here in Madison. You know, that can build comfort such that someone is going to take that next step. And we talked about the valley of death, you know, going from, you know, the lab to the demo scale. Well, there's a bigger valley of death. I don't know if it's deeper or wider uh, that goes from that demo scale to that commercial plant. Well, there is still yet something behind that too, right? Because you have to have that success in that first commercial scale plant in order for that second plant to go. Yeah, I would say a lot of the same. I think for us, so we have the 10 million gallon plant in Georgia, but we also have our second plant in the US. We've already announced 120 million gallons um, in Illinois and Hennepin. Um, but to your point, people wanna know that it works and they wanna see sort of real gallons coming off. Um, <clears throat> and I think there'll be more interest when that happens and sort of will continue to move the industry forward, but it's an expensive process. And so how we can continue to bring that, bring that cost down, the economies of scale, investment, trust, and de-risking is, is a big part of it. 
And then to bring it into the Midwest, I mean, for us in the United States, you're going to go toward the feedstock is. So if we're using, you know, corn as our feedstock, you know, it's going to be in the Midwest. Um, if we're using wood from, you know, for the lignocellulosic portion, we're going to be where the wood is. Maybe it's in northern Wisconsin. Maybe it's in the southeast portion of the U.S. Maybe it's over in uh, the northwest quadrant to the U.S. as well. Um, so beyond supply of feedstock, um, it's it's really you know what are the things that can that you can do to be competitive with respect to the capital and the investments required on the ground to build these plants. Um, access to hydrogen is important for most technologies today. Uh, I also think you know transportation corridors to areas where you're going to find. Uh, the, the best economics for the product that you're trying to sell. Uh, right now, everything's going to California, you know, because uh, they're willing to pay the money to carry the costs associated with that. The difficulty is to get product from the Midwest to California is very complicated. Um, and in particular, if you want to go down the coastline within California, uh, you can't move trains uh, through certain parts of California. Uh, and most of the product today, you know, it gets shipped via train or would be uh, put on through barge. So Meg, I don't know if you have more to add to that. I don't know that this is a question, but in a discussion of Tim's point. I, I think everyone in this room needs to be successful mm -hmm. in order for us to meet this challenge. It's not like his company or her company or his company, right? We, we all need to be successful. And we all need to think about where the feedstocks are and how cheap they're going to be and where there will be the societal imperative to, be, to build these refineries. Uh, and and have them whether it's in Georgia because that's where Beauregard built one as well as these guys right or elsewhere so uh, and we have models we could put 40 of these refineries in north central region in the United States but there's no one planning on digging a hole with the 250 patents that Jennifer and Mark have from technology that we've built so there's still a big inertial hump to get over yeah, if I could just add to that, Tim, I mean, when, when I'm out and talking to certain people and they ask, well, who are your competitors? Uh, quite frankly, I, I, I don't see any competitors in our space. Um, I mean, maybe we're competing for capital, but, you know, Lanzajet is not a competitor of Virant. Um, Lanzajet is actually a great complement to Virant. Uh, the other companies, Jivo, uh, they're not a competitor. You know, we use corn, they use corn. Okay, great. A lot of corn in this country. Um, but, you know, we want them to be successful. Across our industry, there's not been too many success stories. I mean, we kind of joked that, well, one of the reasons why you're in Georgia is because there was a coastal company that didn't really work out so well. Um, but, you know, you know, if you look back, the old guard in this industry, you know, the people who have actually made it over the course of the last 10, 15 years, Lanzatech, Jivo, Fulcrum, Byron, maybe one or two others out there. None of us yet have a commercial plant built. Fulcrum is, now nah, they got a commercial plant, I think, Steve, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but that's why I think we're all cheering for each other. And the industry as a whole is saying, hey, listen, we need to start moving together which means that we also need to work together and find ways that how do we break through these hurdles and these ceilings. Steve's group cafe is doing a great job on the set on the SAF side um, and opening up doors that I would not have visioned you know, would have existed probably even five, six years ago. So, but great point. Tim. I had maybe, oops, do we have time for one more? I was just curious for a, a broad question, maybe along the lines thinking of Tim and as you were saying, the overall industry um, coming from like the Nader, when you said all those, companies didn't move forward and really investment into this area was uh, really hard to find. It seems to have come back a lot. Uh, I was just curious of, you know, the different companies in here, your opinion of where it stands now uh, and has it reached a critical mass or does it still need a lot more uh, now that we see a little bit more investment money flowing in? Uh, 
All right. Um, I didn't want to dominate the stage, but um, I would have to say it's, it's kind of come around full circle again. The difference is who's actually making the investments. I think the people that made the investments in 2008, 9, 10, um, you know, when low carbon fuels started coming through were the Silicon Valley types. And they came in expecting returns along the same timeline as what, you know, they are accustomed to. The fact is in this space, you know, you're not on a three to seven year commercial pathway. You're on a 10 to 20 year commercial pathway. Um, you're not writing code. You're actually looking at spending hundreds of millions of dollars and sometimes billions of dollars to build a plant. Um, and just like if you build a house, you know, you go through the architectural, the engineering, the design, you got to find a contractor. Well, you're talking about refineries. And so this takes a lot of time and you've got to retire a lot of risk before someone is willing to take that ne next step. Silicon, you know, industry back then, you know, they pushed the this is my opinion. They pushed very heavily on the biofuel space, which caused companies to step into markets that they weren't yet ready to do so. I think the market has now matured and you're seeing investments from different industries, which are not looking at this as a cash return investment. This is a strategic investment to grow um, in an area where they're seeing pressures from you know, their shareholders through requirements around ESG, uh, through demands by their, you know, their customers, uh, people would do make choices. Am I going to buy a product because they know that the brand is more sustainable than a different brand? Um, based on those factors, you know, I think the mindset is a little bit different, such that you're seeing a different approach to investing capital in the space. So, Meg? no, I would echo all of that. I think from a policy standpoint, things like the Inflation Reduction Act have changed the game in a lot of ways, and you're seeing a lot of um, new folks coming in. I think, in addition, I think Steve, you mentioned this earlier, but you're seeing investments by the major um, petroleum companies like Shell, um, and we work with a company called Suncor out of Canada. So you're seeing investments by major uh, sort of fossil fuel producers who are really looking to get in this space as well. So I don't know if you have anything you want to add. Well, I'm yes, glad you absolutely. mentioned Marathon because yeah. they're, they're in here too. <laughs> no pun intended. No, I know. I know. I know. Uh, it's an Ironman, Ryan. Right? No, no. But, but you've seen that. Basic science and it goes on at the universities. We pass technology off to you all in WAF and you patent it, you've heard the EERE talk. We've transitioned two technologies that you own into EERE to help do scale up. And then it goes from there into, into the next phase, but it's still, it's an Ironman. Mm -hmm. Cause yeah, you need swim, you need bike and you need run. It's not just a marathon. I, I would honestly say, I mean, not just because Jennifer's in the room, but we wouldn't be where we're at today if it wasn't for Wharf. Um, you know, uh, Wharf encouraged the founders to, of, of Virant, uh, the inventors, to start up the company. They were an equity participant all the way through until the end in which it was sold to Tesoro. And it's, you know, being able to, whether it's ERE through, you know, the, the national labs, universities, private industry, finding ways, how do you bring some of these technologies, prop them up until they can be in a position where they can move to the next step. We can, so, uh, we can also respond to what the gentleman asked. I was involved with Honeywell in the original HEFA product, right? Back in 2008, working with Steve and all. So it's a question of the tug and pull of the markets. At that time, the, incent the drivers were the defense, right? So the first plant that was built, as you said, with venture capital support was the DOD Title III. So the government invested for the military and a lot of like pull was from the military side. Now the difference is the private industry is getting in, venture cap is getting in, commercial is getting in and the world has moved towards, right? You see the Europe making a lot of changes and bringing them today. So it's the, it's the second you know, wave of things and this is a lot stronger and uh, yeah, it'll make a lot more headway, I think. So Avangoa, range fuels, Poet DSM, um, DuPont. I mean, the train wrecks are plentiful. And I was involved in almost every of them. So I'm probably the cost. But <laughs> besides, besides that, 
most of the failures of those systems were on the front end. Mm -hmm. The beauty of Vibrant, the beauty of Lanza, is you've took a refined feedstock product as your primary raw material. Mm -hmm. When we look at cellulosics, all of those are garbage. And I don't mean garbage. I mean, there's so much variability that comes in the gate mm -hmm. that if there's not the attention, and this is my opinion, but if there's not the attention of making that substrate, that feedstock as homogeneous and as available to your process as possible, and that the price signals back to the producers at the farm level, at the forestry level, at the waste hauling level, that's the key. It's not the conversion flat platforms. I'm certain that there's lots of improvement, but it's that in, it's that raw material, that material handling the feedstock. Where do you see? I know Tim. Go ahead. You can take <laughs> so, it. so so Tim, this is why here's another one of your brilliant ideas that it's going to fail <laughs> because it's not homogeneous feedstocks. That's what we heard 15 years ago. Now we have industry saying, we want you to show us you can process mixed feedstocks coming in the gate because I can't guarantee that I'm gonna buy a switchgrass or a forestry pulp on any given year. And so we are starting to do that because we're hearing what industry says and DOE doesn't mind that, it's still within our mission. But the other point that you are absolutely spot on about is we already know after doing this for 15 years, Feedstocks don't stay the same every year. Feedstocks grown in Michigan are not the same as feedstocks grown in, uh, in Wisconsin. If you had bought switchgrass in a drought year and had a certain microbe fermenting it into isobutanol, they wouldn't even grow, never mind make fuel. Well, we know why they won't grow and we've re-engineered the microbe to overcome that. We need more resilient systems that are feedstock agnostic, deal with whatever's cheap and can convert it into products. Uh, so in a friendly way, I disagree with the homogeneous part. We need to be resilient. I'm, I'm totally with what saying is to take that, to take that feedstock stream and to be able to be kind to the conversion process and make it easy for the conversion process. We know which conversion processes are, are more user-friendly for downstream events and which ones are not user-friendly and guess which ones we're walking away from if retrofit the downstream process, whether it's biological or chemical, to work with those inhibitors, as we heard this morning from cyber, there's always gonna be a little bit of something that's gonna muck up your process, whether it's chemical or biological. We know what the mucker ups are and some of them we can bypass and others we can't. And we walk away from those. So if I can add a comment on top of you two, if that's okay. <laughs> this will be the last one then. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, would, I think you're both correct. Um, in the sense that if you look at uh, the industry and where some of the issues uh, arose, it's because people were trying to jump all the way and going for the home run. You know, to be successful in this industry and to move things along, it's like a game of baseball. It's all by hits and hits and hits, right? Get to first base so you can get to second to third and then all the way around. If you're swinging for the fences where some of the people that you mentioned you know, faltered because they jumped all the way looking for how do I get lignocellulosics all the way to that fuel product. Um, the hardest part, quite frankly, is materials handling. You know, every once in a while you may get a shoe, hopefully no body parts with that, but yeah, cell phones or other things in with that mix and that can really mess up your process. Lands of Tech's approach, Lands of Jet's approach, our approach, I think Jivo's approach was all as well as we don't need to fix that today. Let's get assets in the ground. Let's start expanding and let's take a step-by-step -step approach. <clears throat> let's get assets in the ground that can use today's feedstocks to be able to do something today to move this industry forward. Then let the more complicated, difficult processes of converting lignocellulosic materials or other waste materials or bio-based materials into the feedstocks that fit into processes such as these, let them catch up. Because the alternative is 
You just don't do anything. And if truly the effort here is to solve a carbon issue on a global basis, you can't wait you know, for that, that gold strike to come through. You've got to take step by step by step by step. I think, you know, I applaud the organizers who brought this together. I think the people who were involved in this conversation have taken that reasoned approach, whether it's alcohol to jet, whether it's our technology or what have you. We're not going to be successful in achieving the goals around SAF, chemicals or anything, unless you're actually doing something moving forward. So with that, I'll step off the stage. Thank you. Wanted to go back and show Max video. Airlines connect families and communities, enable the global economy, and allow the human spirit to flourish. At LanzaJet, our focus is to enable airlines the freedom to operate and grow, individuals to travel sustainably, and for our global economy to prosper through a much needed energy transition. The airline industry contributes at least 2% of all global CO2 emissions, which is more than a large country such as Brazil. 98% of the carbon footprint by airlines is because of the use of fossil fuels, resulting in aviation being a hard sector to decarbonize. Airlines are now committed to achieving net zero by 2050, in large part by using sustainable aviation fuel, known as SAF. By 2050, 65% of all aviation emissions reductions will come from using SAF. At LanzaJet, our alcohol to jet ATJ technology is a safe, proven solution and approved pathway for the production of sustainable fuels. What's unique and different about what we do is that we take ethanol and convert it to make a substantial amount of sustainable aviation fuel. We are supported and backed by world-class global investors such as British Airways, Suncor Energy, Shell, Mitsui, and our founder, Lanza Tech. We can achieve greater than 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions when using our sustainable fuels. Our Lanza Jet's sustainable aviation fuels maintain superior fuel quality characteristics. They also bring all the sustainability benefits. Most importantly, our SAF is a drop-in jet fuel, which means that no changes are required to equipment, engines, aircraft, or infrastructure. Our Lanza Jet SAF is safe, and we've already completed commercial flights with both Virgin Atlantic and All Nippon Airways. How does it work? We take ethanol and remove the water to create ethylene, and through our process are able to produce only the sustainable fuels we desire, SAF and renewable diesel. Our SAF is jet fuel made from ethanol using sustainable or waste sources. Our first commercial scale plant is expected to start up in 2023. Freedom Pines Fuels in Soperton, Georgia, USA. We are on a path to deploy our Lanza Jet technology in Japan, the EU, UK, Canada, and the US, significantly exceeding our goal of 100 million gallons by 2025. By 2030, we have set a goal to produce 1 billion gallons a year of SAF in the US alone. We can no longer wait to address climate change. At LanzaJet, we believe someday is now. LanzaJet.com Okay, we're going to take a break. Um, if you can be back at 3.05, we're going to wrap up with a conversation to talk about, uh, again, w, uh, the Wisconsin Energy Institute wants to know what y'all think so that they keep doing programs and provide support that works for everybody. <laughs> 